literacy colleges and educators. And um, we brought him into this because of his past research on Aspen Ecology and Management, and also his work in the Stevens Lab at Berkeley on uh, fuels, fire history, and fire effects. He currently is uh, on the graduate faculty at the Teton Science Schools in Jackson, Wyoming, where he conducts uh, applied research in the greater Yellowstone area and teaches graduate level ecology courses. Um, Kevin will mention, I think, uh, in, in his introduction, he'll talk a little bit more about uh, a little bit more about what the Teton schools are all about. So with that, Kevin, it's, it's all yours. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Richard. I appreciate the introduction. And, and thanks to each of you for uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, it's an honor to, uh, to talk about regenerating Aspen and, and Aspen ecology. Um, so uh, please let me know if you have questions as we go through the presentation. You can type them in the uh, chat box, and I'll do my best to answer them or point you towards resources uh, that can answer those questions. Um, so uh, Richard gave a nice introduction to, to myself. I've been asked to give this uh, webinar um, because of sort of my work for my uh, dissertation in the Sierra Nevadas and the Tahoe, Tahoe Basin in the eastern Sierra Nevadas working with Aspen, Aspen Ecology Restoration and, um, and Regeneration. Um, currently, I have a joint appointment as a graduate faculty uh, in the graduate program and the Conservation Research Center at the, the Teton Science Schools. Um, at the graduate program, I teach ecology courses uh, in, a, in an intensive master's program that focuses on field ecology, science education, and, and leadership. Um, as an ecologist here at the Conservation Research Center, uh, I conduct a, applied ecological research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and uh, I'm excited about getting some Aspen projects started out here, um, where Aspen cover is, uh, is more widespread than in the Sierras. Um, the agenda for my talk today, I'm going to start by talking a little bit just about Aspen ecology um, threats and opportunities um, to uh, Aspen cover. And I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about the changing understanding of Aspen ecology in, in the past oh, oh, two decades or decade or so. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about regenerating Aspen and different, different strategies and um, protocols for that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. So first off, just a little bit about the distribution of Aspen. As I'm sure many of you are aware, if you read a paper on Aspen, typically the first sentence is that it's the most widely distributed upland tree in uh, North America. Uh, which, is, which is true. We look here at the gray area of the distribution of Aspen. Uh, it has a wide distribution and a broad amplitude. And so you can see the distribution there from really from the east coast to the, to the west coast, up, up into Alaska and the boreal forest, and even down into Mexico. Scott Stevens, my advisor at uh, UC Berkeley, has done a lot of research in the Sierra San Pedro Martir Mountains down in, in Baja, California, and was lucky enough to go on uh, some research trips down there, and we saw quaking Aspen uh, all the way down in Mexico, and you can see some, some outlier populations uh, even further south. Um, the amplitude is also pretty big for this species. Um, it's, it's often considered a riparian species, but um, it, it grows in the, in, the in the shrub steppe, as well as parklands, um, montane, subalpine, and boreal forest. So it's not just a riparian species. There are definitely upland stands. And um, it, it really has the capability to survive in a lot of different uh, ecological conditions. And that's likely the reason for its broad distribution. Uh, it, it's, it's an important species and becoming more important as maintaining biological diversity is, is, is becoming more of a target for managers. Um, the biological diversity observed in Aspen stands is higher than, than that of the kind of neighboring conifer stands. Um, uh, everything from invertebrates to birds to small mammals to large mammals uh, typically will, will use Aspen stands often more than they use conifer stands. So uh, for maintaining biological diversity, it's become uh, a target for managers. Um, it also, uh, even though it's considered a species that grows in more mesic environments, the water use efficiency of Aspen is, uh, is actually greater than that of conifers. So um, increased water delivery could be, could be an advantage to having aspen forest versus uh, a conifer forest, which is 
um, typically what, what might otherwise occupy those areas. Uh, it's fire resistant and resilient. Uh, Aspen is a vigorous reef sprouter. It's uh, an early cereal pioneer species often and, um, and provides a, a lot of um, ecosystem either resistance or resilience to fire resistant, meaning it doesn't burn, it's not as flammable and retains higher moisture than, um, than conifers, and resilient because it vigorously resprouts and as I'll talk about later, potentially reseeds uh, after fire events. And then the aesthetics are also important. It's, a, it's an important species for, for tourists and for aesthetics. Uh, it's, a, it's a species considered beautiful by many. So some current and future challenges. Um, currently, sudden acid decline or SAD uh, has been documented in, in Colorado and Utah, even Arizona, I've heard reports. Um, uh, Warall has published a paper, a couple papers, 2008, 2010, um, Andereg, 2012. Are some papers that have both documented this decline, mostly in Colorado, and have also um, given some some uh, evidence that it, it's due to um, drought. And the droughts of 2002, 2003 were pretty extreme. And um, Aspen stands didn't show the impact of that, or at least didn't start to per precipitously decline until you know 2007, 2008 even later. So it was a delayed mortality, most likely due to, to drought. Um, succession to conifers is another, uh, another common concern for aspen uh, in, in places where they are early cereal species. Over time, without disturbances, they'll often be uh, outcompeted by conifers that, have, uh, that are more shade tolerant. Even, even intolerant conifers like lodgepole pine can grow in the understory. Of, of Aspen and um, with, with higher potential growth and uh, more shade tolerance that over time they'll outcompete the Aspen without a disturbance. Climate change is also um, predicted to kind of negatively impact current Aspen stands. Uh, increased aridity, hydraulic stress, and then a, a migrating climatic envelope that uh, may move faster than Aspen are able are all concerns for the future of, of Aspen cover. I'm going to uh, take a closer look at a study. This is a modeling study done by Ray Phelps et al. in 2009. And um, they, they focused on Aspen and looked at the current distribution and then, the, and then the likely distribution of that climate envelope that supports Aspen um, up until 2090. And so we'll take a look at some of those maps here just to illustrate the point about what's happening to the climate envelope to support Aspen. So here, um, the red and yellow, for, for our purposes, um, just indicate the current Aspen cover or predicted Aspen cover currently. Um, the red is, is, is where Ray Phelps model predicted better than, than where the yellow did. But for our purposes, just look at where the red and yellow are. And don't differentiate here. But this is the current distribution. This next slide here is the distribution in 2030. We're going to be moving forward in time here to 2060 and 2090. So I'm going to replay that just to, just to take a quick look here. Here's the current distribution. I'm going to fast forward to 2090, and it becomes apparent how the climate, climatic envelope for, for Aspen is kind of evaporating off the landscape here. So here's the predicted climate envelope for 2090, according to some modeling done by Rayfeld and others. And it's concerning for, for anyone who wants to maintain um, Aspen cover on the landscape. And we'll see another modeling study a little later in this um, presentation that has a very similar projection um, for the north in Canada over time. And, um, and so this is, this is a, a challenge that is likely to be faced by Aspen and other tree species in the coming century. So uh, in addition to the, the threats or, or challenges for Aspen in the future, there, there may be some future opportunities um, because Aspen is uh, uh, kind of an early cereal pioneer or can act as one. So increased fire, fire severity may yield more Aspen cover in the future if it can take advantage of that um, you know, temporal niche that's, um, that's opened by a, a disturbance like a fire. Uh, increased conifer bark beetle outbreaks um, may favor aspen regeneration and growth, and there's some evidence for that in um, Colorado and other places where mountain pine beetle 
is um, causing mortality of a lot of conifers, uh, which, are, which are competing against aspen. So that may be another opening opportunity for aspen. Uh, a caveat here from, from Dominique Kulikowski's um, presentation at a Restoring the West conference in, in Logan, Utah last fall is that for either of, these, either of these hypotheses to be correct, future climate will need to be suitable for aspen regeneration and growth. And that you know, Ray Felt modeling exercise we just looked at um, punctuates that with a question mark. Where, where will the, the climate envelope for aspen be? And, and what areas will support aspen growth in the future? Um, and again, the, the importance of the relative contribution of disturbance, which typically will favor Aspen, versus climate, which according to, to modeling and future projection may not favor Aspen, at least where it currently is, um, the, the relative contributions of disturbance versus climate are going to be important in the future um, for, for predicting or understanding where, where Aspen is going to live and survive. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the changing perspectives on, on aspen ecology. The conventional wisdom, and this is a lot of research was done on aspen, you know, in, in even the mid-1900s, um, there's a lot of early work that's been done on aspen, and a lot of it still applies. But a lot of the conventional wisdom that's been passed down from early research is being challenged today. So the conventional wisdom is that aspen reproduction is all about suckers or asexual reproduction or sprouts. And so I'm going to use sucker or sprout uh, or ram it all interchangeably today in this presentation. That, th all those terms refer to vegetative reproduction coming from lateral roots, underground roots um, that are kind of rhizominous. And um, those stems are, um, as many of you I'm sure know, are clones of the kind of mother tree or the larger organism that's supporting a lot of individual stems. Um, so it was all about asexual reproduction. The thought was that sexual reproduction was rare and unimportant. Um, and, uh, and, and that's being challenged today. There is also a belief that the, that the clones were all large and that they were very old, some hypothesized even, even existing since the, the Pleistocene or the last glacial maximum 10,000 years ago. It was also thought that there was low genetic diversity and that genetic diversity was um, maybe unimportant for, uh, for understanding regeneration or, or aspen genetic dynamics. And then also it was thought that there was a single successional pathway. Um, and, and that was that, that aspen was an early serial species that uh, would do well after disturbance but would be, would be uh, well, outcompeted by by conifers or um, or other vegetation over over time, and all of these views have some truth to them, but they're being challenged currently. And so, the the modern paradigm, and I'll talk more about each of these, is that sexual reproduction is likely more common than we once thought. Genetic diversity is is high and likely important in aspen stands. Uh, clones are smaller than what we once thought and that there are multiple aspen types and successional sequences that, that need to be recognized by managers and other, other uh, interested parties in, in aspen uh, ecology and regeneration. And now I'll talk a little bit about and show you some, uh, some current research to, to refute the kind of conventional wisdom. Um, here's a couple quotes, one from 1995. Um, historically, we, we thought aspen sexual reproduction was exceedingly rare. Um, Long, a silver culturalist at the University of Utah in 1995 in a silver cultural textbook wrote, sexual reproduction in the Western United States is precluded by environmental conditions that effectively prevent seedling establishment. Similarly, uh, in 1985, uh, this was published in, in Debye and Winker's, um, Winker's uh, kind of seminal work on Aspen. Under the marginal conditions that prevail in some regions, Aspen can consistently reproduce only vegetatively. So, Again, it was thought sexual reproduction was exceedingly rare and really kind of unimportant in understanding aspen re regeneration. Well, uh, recent, recent observations um, have, have challenged this. What I've listed here are just the, the documented seedlings that I know about. I'm sure there are others, but, um, and some of these are published, and I've, I've tried to include the publications there. Um, going back to 85 uh, here in Grand Teton National Park, which is 
where I am, uh, K, K documented some acid regeneration. And then in the, the 1988 Yellowstone fires, probably the most famous um, reproduction by seed for Aspen was documented by Rami, um, Turner, and others in 97, 2005, K in 1993. Um, and then um, Mary Lou um, Fairweather has been a, a great advocate and, um, and, and a keen eye for understanding Aspen regeneration in, in Arizona. And Quinn and Wu published um, some seedling um, evidence in, in uh, let's see, where. Where were they? In 1994, they published that. Fairweather et al. More recently, in the in the last decade, have um, have documented a number of Aspen re regeneration events uh, after fires. Um, in my own research in the in the Sierra Nevadas, both in the Tahoe Basin and eastern Sierras, um, found uh, hundreds of, of seedlings. Uh, specifically, I found some in the Angora Fire area in Lake Tahoe. Very few, just a couple. And, uh, and then in Silver Creek Fire 2008 in the Eastern Sierra Nevadas, we, we found hundreds and, and actually um, tagged 125, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so as we start looking for them, we start finding Aspen seedlings. And I think, uh, as, as, John, uh, as Long has said, uh, that was the quote from 1995 yesterday, they, they probably just um, we're not looking for them and just assume that, that the seedlings were, were in fact asexual sprouts when in fact seedling regeneration was probably going on the whole time. Um, when we look at Aspen genetic diversity and we look at um, the evidence of, of how much genetic diversity is actually out on the landscape, it supports the idea that sexual reproduction is likely more common than we thought. This is a study by Mock at all. She's at the University of Utah, and, and they actually did genetic analysis on a number of stands in, in Logan, Utah, and further south in the state. And what they found was there was a lot more genetic diversity than they assumed. Each of these white lines on this, um, on this image here shows uh, the delineation of a, of a single stand. What they did was they went into the stand and, and sampled on a strict 50-meter grid, and they just took some leaves from each tree on that grid and then went back to the lab and did the, the genetic analysis to understand which ones were clones and which ones were unique genets or, or, or genets, um, which is interchangeable with clone, and I'll use both of those words in this presentation. So they sampled uh, 812 stems here, and they found more genetic diversity than they thought. They found 195 different clones. Uh, most genets or most clones were only represented by two or fewer stems uh, in their study, and uh, they concluded that establishment from seed is likely more common and, and important than historically assumed. Clones were smaller than they assumed and, and were likely not as ancient as they, as they originally thought. Okay, they, they also did a, a more southern site. The, the upper right clone here in this image is the Pando clone, which some of you may have heard of. It, was, it has been hypothesized to be the largest organism in the world, um, and uh, it in fact is a very large Aspen stand. It's about 110 acres, or 44 hectares large. Um, but what they found is that it's actually not just one genotype or one clone. Um, it actually consisted of uh, a number of clones. So here they sampled 580 stems. They detected 61 different clones. And only three of the clones were represented by more than 10 stems. And those were the largest clones here. That, that was, in fact, the Pando clone. It, it turned out to be 110 acres or 44 hectares. Uh, but most clones that they found were small in size. And, um, and this research has been replicated in the Southern Cascades. De Woody et al., um, who was a collaborator on this study, did a similar study in the, in the Southern Cascades in California and found that stands were small and genetic diversity was high. So establishment from seed has been ecologically important in the past. There's more genetic diversity than we assumed. And clones are probably smaller and not as old as we once thought. Now, in both of these images that I've shown from the mock study, um, the, the black and white uh, symbols here indicate whether or not the clones were diploid or triploid. And um, typically, diploid cells will have two copies of each chromosome, one, one from each parent. And, and aspen is a, is a dioecious tree, so it has male, male clones and female clones, and they, they reproduce to form seeds 
that, um, that typically you would assume are diploid. They have one chromosome of each type from mom and dad. Um, triploids have three copies of those chromosomes. And so if we look at these images, we see that there are a number of triploid clones out on the landscape. And Mock et al. found that the triploid clones were the largest. And so that led to, to more recent work. In 2012, uh, she published this paper here. And um, what they did was they did a kind of a continental scale look at, at the cytotype or whether or not it was a diploid or triploid organism. And what they found were that the largest clones uh, were triploid, and a higher proportion of western aspen south of the last glacial maximum were triploid. So this blue line here indicates the, our best estimate of the extent of glacial ice or um, in the last glacial maximum about 10,000 years ago. And we see kind of a clear delineation here of, of you know, where ice covered it and where these stands must have established in the last, uh, you know, after the last glacial maximum, fewer are um, triploid. When we look at western Aspen in the western United States, we see the higher proportion of triploid um, Aspen stands there. Um, and so the proportions here that are shown are only proportions of the genotypes found. They're not proportions of stems. So if we understand that the uh, triploid stands are likely larger, that the proportion of stems that are actually triploid are probably even greater than the proportion of red in each of these pie diagrams here. And, and here's a, an actual look at the chromosomes. Uh, just to understand triploid a little bit better, um, the red shown here are the triploid organisms, and, uh, and the blue are diploid. This is one, one, uh, a pair of chromosomes for each numbered chromosome, one from mom, one from dad, makes a diploid here. And the triploid has uh, one-third more chromosomes. And, and you can really see that with this long chromosome here. You can see two there, uh, down in the diploid, one and two. And for the triploid, you can count three of those. So it's got three copies of each chromosome. And um, the, there are likely some interesting consequences of this finding. Triploids typically in the plant communities, tri triploids, triploids typically grow faster, can be sterile or have greater reduced, or reduced fertility, and have bigger cell sizes, which may influence phys physiology, especially water transport. So in this paper, Mach and others make some interesting hypotheses about the consequences of being diploid or triploid. and, um, and, and the, the implications that has for managers or other, other people that want to facilitate the persistence of Aspen or regeneration of Aspen. And this is an area that um, a lot more research is needed. And, um, and I know that Mox Group is planning to do more. And, and it will be interesting to watch how this story unfolds. So uh, additionally, just, just another last piece of the, the kind of new paradigm of Aspen ecology is that there, there are a variety of Aspen functional types and successional sequences. And, and Paul Rogers uh, at the University of Utah is doing a, a lot of great work in this area. This is a paper that is um, actually currently in press. And, um, but uh, I got an early release of this and, and I'd like to talk about some of, some of their findings. What they're trying to do is to, to, to better delineate different functional types of Aspen. And so um, they, they want to make it clear that not all Aspen are serial. There are the serial Aspen stands, and those tend to be in the Boreal and the Montane areas. And so that would be uh, in, the, in the green, the dark green or the light green here. Those tend to be in the more mesic areas are the serial stands. Um, but they also recognize that there are stable Aspen stands that, that seem to be continually reproducing and don't seem to be encroached by conifers and uh, likely have been Aspen for, for a long time and will continue to be Aspen for a long time. They find those typically in the, in the parklands uh, here, the yellow area, and the Colorado Plateau uh, down here. And um, those uh, stable stands tend to be in the more uh, zero or dry environments where, where Aspen is found. And then they, they, they do recognize serial stable where, where they can take a variety of different successional sequences and they, they call the riparian areas those serial sta stable stands. And, and again, um, just want to make the point that this is not to be used in, a, in an exclusive manner, but is, is meant to open our thinking that there, there could be a variety of successional 
sequences for aspirin and a number of different functional types of aspirin. So this is at the regional scale. The authors here also break down um, aspirin functional types by, by, by more of the landscape scale and, and by topography. So these are two other images from this paper where they, they, they delineate where different stands might be found on the landscape. So, so here we have the riparian, the serial, um, serial stable riparian. They, they label this here as serial aspen. They recognize that riparian could also be stable. They show a snow pocket stable aspen stand here um, in, in topography where um, there would be a snow pocket, increased soil moisture, and, um, and in this case, reduced competition from conifers. Um, they show a montane cereal aspen stand here in north facing slope in the montane area, and then an elevation and aspect limited stable stand here. So in a very interesting read and, and opens our minds to, to um, you know, a variety of successional sequences that Aspen could, um, could show. Kevin, um, there's a little question here about what is parkland? Oh, that's a good Find question. That? Yeah, so parklands here, you know, uh, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure I have a great answer, but it's kind of the south, uh, south of the boreal forest, uh, a little, a little drier area. Um, parkland probably has something to do with the topography. Uh, in that area, but but um, I have to go back to this paper and see exactly how they how they define that. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. Um, but they did delineate the, the parkland and the Colorado Plateau area. These areas that were uh, kind of delineated as typically stable aspen stands as the more as the more xeric environments. So this is south of the, the boreal belt and um, likely lower lower rainfall in those areas. I see your question now on the, on the chat. Sorry, I missed that. I should keep my eye on that. Um, all right, so um, now we're moving into the, the kind of third part of the presentation about um, reforestation options. So I'm breaking this into kind of two, two different pathways. One is revitalizing an existing stand. Um, the other pathway I'll talk about is, is establishing uh, a stand where one had not existed before. And I think um, both of these are important, and, um, and, and we'll, I'll spend some time on each of them. So revitalizing an existing stand um, could be done through a, a variety of means, uh, removing competing vegetation, conducting a prescribed fire, doing a combination treatment of, of vegetation control, and then prescribed fire. Um, root stimulation or root ripping is something that uh, Wayne Shepherd has, has um, experimented with. I'll, I'll, sh I'll share some results with you there. Protection from herbivory. Um, we know that browsers um, can impact aspen stands and uh, protecting in areas of high browse pressure is important. And then clear felt coppice, which is kind of well-known regeneration method for industrial scale, more industrial scale forestry um, for aspen. So I um, also want to recognize that uh, other options are to do nothing. Um, so you know, action should be based on the, the vigor, disease, and, and reproduction um, of the stands. If, if a clone is showing little signs of decline, disease, or distress from competition, um, and also contains multiple age classes and is successfully regenerating, that likely doesn't need any, any treatment, which, which may be obvious, but uh, I want to include that. In 2001, Campbell and Bartos came up with five different risk factors for aspen stands that I think are important to mention and, and understand. Any one of these or combination of these could indicate that the, the aspen stand is, is in risk of being lost and, and could benefit from some, some revitalization or, or restoration. So if, if the conifer canopy cover is, less, is greater than 25%, um, or if the aspen canopy cover is less than 40%, that, that's an indication of, of some risk factors. Um, if the dominant aspen stamps are greater than 100 years old, if the aspen regeneration from 5 to 15 feet is less than 500 stems per acre, or if the sagebrush cover is greater than, than 10%. So they delineated those, those risk factors. Most stands that are in need of restoration are likely um, suffering from, from more than one of those risk factors. And, and in recent um, uh, assessments that I've seen for like the Tahoe Basin, uh, a high proportion of the stands are classified at, at moderate to high risk of being lost by, by some of these characteristics. 
Okay. Um, so we're going to some some reforestation options here. So uh, um, the other the other option is establishing a new stand or or genet, um, and that can be done by um, outplanting seedlings or clones, um, transplanting ramets. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about an experiment I did with that. Um, natural post-fire seedling establishment um, and post-fire seed dispersal to suitable microsites. And I'll, I'll talk about each of these as we as we get into these strategies. So first off, back to revitalizing an existing stand. Uh, Wayne Shepherd has produced the what he calls the Aspen Regeneration Triangle, and, and these are the kind of three prerequisites to get adequate Aspen regeneration from an existing stand. And the first being hormonal stimulation. Um, suckering in Aspen or, or asexual sprouting is controlled primarily by plant hormones. Um, typically, the um, a live tree, the above ground portion will produce the, the hormone auxin and transport that to the to the roots. Uh, as long as the roots are getting auxin, then that suppresses the sprouting response. And so the auxin uh, represses sprouting. If for some reason that apical dominance is cut off by a fire or clear fell coppice or, or disease or injury, that auxin supply is going to be reduced to the roots and that's going to create a cascade of, of um, effects that will basically stop suppressing the sprouting and will cause uh, sprouting to initiate. But that alone is not enough. Um, the environment needs to be um, adequate and suitable for aspen regeneration to, to grow and survive. Uh, typically, the, the two main requirements are, are um, you know, enough solar radiation and ample soil moisture. And then, in addition, if, if it's an area of high browsing pressure, those new stems likely need to be protected from, from browsing. Um, as, as they can get hammered pretty hard and that can uh, reduce the viability of, of or the longevity of that regeneration. So hormonal stimulation, an adequate environment, and protection from browsing. Okay, and then on the left, um, just the same, the same strategies that are listed before for revitalizing an existing stand. And now we'll talk about each of those. So first, removing competing vegetation. This has been shown to be effective uh, in a number of places here on the lower left. Um, this is an area in the um, Kaibab National Forest in, in Arizona where there were really only two remaining stems of Abastin encroached uh, pretty heavily by conifers. They did a removal and they fenced it. It's hard to see, but four years later there was a, a flush of, of new growth and uh, successful, successful regeneration of those Aspen. Um, uh, Bobette Jones and, and others in 2005 published a study from um, the uh, Lassen National Forest where they did kind of removal. This is, this is before treatment, after treatment, and then four years after treatment here where they saw a, um, a significantly larger number of, of ramets and regeneration in the treated areas than, than non-treated areas. And then similarly in 2012, I published a paper that um, followed some the Bureau of Land Management treatment areas in the eastern Sierras close to Mono Lake. Virginia Creek is the area where these were treated. This is before treatment, after treatment, and five years after treatment. And so um, there's, there's ample evidence that uh, just removing the competing vegetation will release the, uh, the aspen and uh, facilitate asexual reproduction. Now, one site, and, and, and this is just a caution, one of the three conifer removal sites in that study that I referenced before and in my 2012 paper, um, one of those sites uh, showed regeneration failure. So this is, this is a little light, but um, I think we can still see it. The, the dotted line are, are the control stands, control transects. The, uh, the solid line are the treated transects, and you can see over time in this red site, which was Virginia Creek Site 2, uh, initially because of the mechanical treatment, we had a reduced amount of the suckers, but then over time it rebounded and um, had, we had significantly more by five, five years after treatment. In this green site, in the blue site we see a similar trend. In the green site we had a regeneration failure. It, it really, um, the treated stands showed no better uh, reproduction than those untreated transects. And when we went back to look five years after uh, the treatment, we saw that a lot of the overstory, overstory stems were dead 
uh, and 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 here's a picture here of of those stems, uh, a close up of one of them, and we we noticed that the southern aspect of the stem was was peeling, and um, the northern aspect of the stem seemed to be intact, um, and we did we did a, a spatial analysis here to look at what what the proximate cause of of death might have been, and what we found that were, were that on on those residual stems that died, we found both an increased basal area of conifers removed on the southern side. So this was a heavily encroached stand by a very large uh, lodgepole pine, and they removed a, a, a large proportion, or almost all of the lodgepole pine. Um, and those that died had more basal area of lodgepole pine removed on the southern side, and those stems were, were older than those that survived. So the dead stems had more conifers removed on the southern side and were of greater chronological age. And what we hypothesized happened here was they kept, that the stems got sun scalded. Uh, the, the incoming uh, solar radiation after the extreme thinning was, was a shock to the aspen stems. They, they died. There was uh, some sprouting, but not very much. And that caused kind of a, uh, a failure to show significant differences between the treated and untreated areas uh, in that one site. So just as a caution, um, th this doesn't show up in the literature a lot, but, but it does show up a couple times. Just as a caution, sun scald for um, severely encroached stands or, or stands of advanced age or both um, should be recognized as a risk factor. Okay, so let's see. I have about 10 minutes left. I got to I got to get get rolling here. So, um, prescribed fire and combination treatments have been shown to be effective. They provide hormonal stimulation, um, a nutrient pulse, increased solar radiation, increased soil temperature, um, and they kill the competing vegetation. And all of those are important to to reproduce aspen. Here, uh, Wayne Shepherd has um, an interesting study where they did a, a kind of a removal treatment. On, a, on a, a larger stand, and in half the stand they conducted a fire afterwards, and in half the stand they didn't. And what they showed here is the dark lines are the combined treatment where they removed conifers and conducted a prescribed fire, and they had uh, increased density and increased height, height growth in those combined treatments versus just the conifer removal. So combined treatments can be effective. A couple of points that they did, I think, that, that, that facilitated that success were they just left light logging slash. They didn't leave all the slash. And they burned in the spring when the soils were still moist to help protect the roots. Uh, some some uh, results from studies that I've done and, and uh, hope to publish soon. This is a, there's a lot on this graph. But it, com it compares both restoration treatments and uh, wildfire at different severities. So I'll just walk you through this here. The, the orange line here are the control uh, stands that were untreated. They show, and then the, the, the y-axis here is, is the density of ramets. Um, the purple is the conifer removed stands. So over time, they show uh, an increase, though slight, above the controls. The maroon line here is the prescribed fire treatments. And there were two, two sites of prescribed fire, and they show an increase more so than, than the kind of removal sites. And then the green, blue, and red lines are from wildfires where aspen stands were burned. Uh, there were four different wildfires where I sampled aspen stands. And uh, I stratified those sampling sites by fire severity. And so the green was low fire severity, the blue was moderate fire severity, and the red was, was high fire severity. And, um, clear differences emerged where the, the, the greater the disturbance severity, the increased uh, density of ramets we found after the, the fire, and, uh, and in fact, increased growth rate. It's not shown on this graph, but the, um, the height and diameter of, of those stems were also greater. Um, it's important to note that in, in none of these areas was browse pressure high, and, um, and so I think that's an important caveat here, but we found that with increasing disturbance severity, we have increasing post-fire or post-disturbance uh, aspen density. So root stimulation, I'll just talk briefly about this. This is uh, a root ripper um, uh, mounted on a tractor where they basically just sever the roots from the stand. Here, here's the, the adult stand. Here's where they did the ripping. And then here's where they got regeneration. So basically, they're cutting off that oxygen supply to those roots and causing that sprouting suppression to stop. And that's been a successful uh, treatment in, in some uh, experimental studies. 
Protection from herbivory, this, this has uh, been known for a long time to be important. This picture illustrates how within the, the exclosure, the acid are doing great, and outside you, you can barely find an acid stem because of browsing pressure. So wherever browsing pressure is high, we need to protect the regeneration. All right, now on to the last, the last note here, establishing a new stand or genet. I'll talk about out, out planting seedlings or clones, um, transplanting, and natural post-fire seedling establishment and post-fire seed dispersal. So excuse me, I'm going to go a little faster than I had planned. Um, and I'm just going to ask Richard, what time should I shoot to be done? It's, I got 12:45 right now. Um, well, let's Maybe. see. If you're operating on mountain time, uh, you have plenty of time, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, on Pacific Standard Time, you should probably try to wrap it up in about five minutes. Okay, great. Well, so we have that, so we have some time for questions. Okay, that's uh, that sounds good. Um, so let's uh, let's take a look here. First, uh, outplanting. So uh, there's not a lot of studies that have done outplanting. This is one from 2005 of Wayne Shepherd in Colorado outplanted um, 742 greenhouse-grown seedlings. And uh, they just wanted to see you know, how successful would this be. They fenced uh, half of them here in this triangle, and they left half of them unfenced. Um, overall, uh, five-year survival rate was about 18% in the fenced area and 23% in the unfenced area. So an interesting finding that browse pressure probably wasn't very high here. They had higher success rate outside the fence. And they actually think that uh, rodents played a big role in um, in, within the fence, they were protected from predators and, and uh, had a negative impact on the aspen. Um, so some success, but uh, the success rate was not um, not very high. About about uh, you know 18 to 23 percent here. Um, Outplanting clones. This is something that's been done probably more often. This is an interesting uh, cloning technique um, pioneered by Driesen et al. in 2006. Uh, we, we take a cutting or, or even a seedling and grow it uh, in a special container that has this removable section down below where you can sever the roots and then those will sprout into new clones and they've done this successfully in um, Arizona. And, uh, and here's their, their outplanting effort to plant these clones out. And again, you can see the, the effort that they're putting in here. They fence this area, they have cones, they have netting to try to reestablish this aspen stand with outplanted clones. There's a link there to, to some of their work. I did an experiment uh, in the Tahoe Basin with ramet transplantation. I was interested to see, one, could we be successful at just in the field digging up some ramets and transplanting them? And I used two different sources. I used this post-fire ramet. This was in the Angora fire. This was a, about a one hectare stand that burned and regenerated vigorously. I also used a source nearby that didn't burn, and I used some of the, the smaller ramets, which were in the understory, and we found interesting differences. Uh, here's a picture of one of the ramets, the post-fire ramets we dug up. Again, it has multiple stems. We transplanted that to a riparian area that didn't have aspen prior to the fire. After, uh, after three years, uh, we found that um, the, the mortality rate was very different. In, for those taken from the burn source, we had a 5% mortality rate or a 95% survival rate. For those taken from the unburned stand, half of them died, 50% mortality rate. Um, so we found uh, big differences. We went back to do some um, destructive sampling from the same sources. What we found was that the root-to-shoot ratios were, were very different. Um, for those from the burn source, had many more fine roots to shoots ratio. So, so they, they were able to kind of gather more resources from that small plug that we pulled out versus the unburned that had a very low fine root-to-shoot ratio. Conversely, the large root-to-shoot ratio, and, and by large, I'm, I'm talking about greater than 8 millimeters in diameter, and, and by small, I'm talking about less than 1.5 millimeters. We, we destructively sampled their roots. Um, they had uh, a much higher large root-to-shoot ratio, and, and I'm interpreting this as those ramets which were in the understory of that um, mature stand were really being supported by the larger trees, and those large roots were used mostly for transport and not, most, not so much for um, uh, resource extraction from the soils. Um, so uh, transplants, post-fire ramet transplants uh, can, are, can be a successful source. We also found there was no del deleterious effects to the regenerating stand from taking those transplants from that burn stand. 
This is an interesting study by Gray. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but they did uh, a provenance, kind of a garden experiment, a common garden experiment here um, in, uh, in Canada. And, and what I want to show you here is that as they moved, the, these colors represent the different, different regions. As they moved genetic material northward, they did better than the local. The local is this triangle. All those that they moved northward uh, grew more than the local genotype did. And so it just raises the question of that moving climate envelope and, um, and uh, I think it poses some important questions about how we manage in the future. This is their modeling effort of the climate envelope changing from the 2020s to the 2080s. The darker color here is the prime, prime environment for Aspen. And uh, as you get lighter, the uh, Aspen frequency classes would go down. You can see that over time, that envelope is moving northward and or just kind of disappearing. Brings up important questions for our seed, seed zones. And here's a, just a seed zone map in California and, and how, we, how we approach um, the reforestation, the genetic source of our reforestation. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is natural post-disturbance seedling establishments. This is, uh, we found many sites of um, seedlings established in the Silver Creek fire. The three-year survival rate of the three sites that we monitored was, was 90%, 88%, and 0%. And that, that 0% was inundated with water, and basically they all, they all got drowned the year after they established. Um, but the other sites showed pretty high survival rates over three years, and likely some of them will, will survive long-term to provide new, new genetics on the scene that may be better adapted to, to current and future uh, environments and climates. And the last thing is we, we did this post-seeding dis dispersal uh, kind of pilot study where we, we gathered seeds. And here you can see the seeds are super small. They're about a little smaller than sesame seeds. And we just uh, scattered them on some, we, we, we made some bare ground close to those sites where we found the natural seedlings. And we wanted to see, can we get seeds to establish purposely? And uh, so we scattered 30 seeds in little micro plots, 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. And um, what we found is that some of them did germinate. Our, our three-month germination rate was 16 to 50 percent. When we came back one year later, many of them had been overtaken by this competing vegetation. So we had a low survival rate, zero to seven percent. My thought here is that had we done it one year post-fire, we did two years post-fire. Had we done it one year post-fire, we, we actually would have had a better survival rate. So just want to throw that out as, as a potential idea for uh, regenerating Aspen after fire, taking advantage of that temporal niche of the post-fire environment. So just a quick summary here, uh, revitalizing a stand. Um, first off, does Aspen need treatment? If it does, um, if, it, if it doesn't, we, we can just monitor it. If it does, then, then really the next question is, what, what are the, what's the threat? Is it browsing, vegetation, uh, competing vegetation, lack of regeneration, or disease, or drought? Each of those have their own potential solutions from fencing, removing vegetation, prescribed fire, root stimulation and our irrigation. Um, and then lastly, establishing a new stand. Um, if it's a post-fire environment, that represents an opportunity for, for, for these early, early cereal species to do well. If it doesn't, like we saw in northern Arizona, you're probably going to have to put a lot of time and effort to establish a stand out planting seedlings or clones. If it is post-fire, you might do a ramage transplantation. You might outplant seedlings or clones. You might do a seed collection and distribution or uh, look for natural regeneration and, and help protect or facilitate that. For all of these, consider protection, controlling competing vegetation, irrigation, and, and monitoring. And uh, with that, I want to point you to this invaluable resource for uh, Aspen the Sierra Nevadas um, and, uh, by, by Wayne Shepard, Paul Rogers, David Burton, and Dale Bartos. Um, and I uh, just want to thank many of my partners and uh, field techs my wife and, and other folks that came out to help me with this field work. And I um, want to ask if there are questions. There's, there's ample references here that if you're interested in, I hope you'll go back and, and check out some of these. And I'm always happy to, to answer questions beyond this webinar. Thanks, everyone, for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, incidentally, all you folks should know that uh, the, a PDF of Kevin's presentation will be posted on the website. With your permission, Kevin, is that OK? Yeah, absolutely. OK, good. Uh, there are a few questions. Um, 
Uh, Rich Walker's got one. We have time for maybe three or four. Uh, Lorna Dovalmi's got one too, so we'll take those one at a time. I have a couple questions of my own. Uh, look from your map, like the climate change modeling projected that uh, Aspen would be extirpated from California by 2090. Is that the, is that the way you see it? Yeah, well, I, I I would say you know at the broad you know regional scale that that modeling was done, that's what it looks like. I think um, it, it it's unlikely that Aspen will be gone by that time. There there will certainly be microsites where where Aspen um, can persist and or potentially even um, you know form a new stand. But I do think that uh, Aspen cover, even though it's only considered about one percent of the Sierras, Aspen cover is likely to go down as the climate envelope kind of leaves the Sierras. I think it will persist in certain microsites. And again, it, it depends on that balance between uh, disturbance, which may favor more Aspen, versus climate, which, which according to the Rayfeld modeling and many others, is likely not to favor Aspen cover. So that, that balance is going to be important. Oh, I had another question there. It, uh, it seemed like from what you were saying that transplants, if you're going to do a transplanting, uh, you should try to get the transplant uh, material from burns. Yeah, that's that's uh, our research clearly shows that they survived much better. Their growth was greater, and uh, in fact, it had it had no discernible negative impact to the regenerating asthma because it was so dense, and they're going to thin anyway over time. Um, that uh, I think that's really a viable alternative if you can get in there. And we we utilize a lot of um, volunteer labor for that, and uh, I think it's a, a, a really valuable way to engage the community, um, even school kids or, or other volunteers, um, to better understand Aspen ecology and to actually play a role in, in community forestry. Uh, Rich Walker's got a, a question. Uh, uh, can we infer from the current distribution that triploid uh, genotypes are older than the diploid since they occur more often outside the areas of Pleistocene glaciation? Only Rich would ask um, a question about that. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's one of the, the conclusions that the authors um, that the authors kind of insinuate there, um, you know, aging an Aspen clone is, is still problematic. There are advancing genetic techniques that, that may look at mutation rates and, and try, to, try to understand through genetics how old a clone might be. But um, th that's one possible takeaway um, from that. It could also be that, that um, triploids, that's a better environment for triploids to reproduce. And we still don't know if the triploid seeds are, are um, kind of less fertile, um, or that their reproduction, their their sexual reproduction may be less um, successful in triploids, that that comes from other plant organisms, um, and that that's a working hypothesis. So uh, that there's still research that needs to be done there, but potentially they could be older in that area, or there could be other environmental um, factors that favor uh, triploids in that area, and that that they're not actually older clones or genotypes. So. I, don't, I think the jury is still out on that one, but um, that is one potential conclusion that, that or, or hypothesis that one could come to from that, from that map that Mock and others produced in 2012. Well, maybe Rich can take a second PhD by investigating that. Um, yeah, I mean, they're working on it. It would be really interesting, yeah. You know, Lorna, Lorna's asking about removing uh, conifer, how much should be removed all or a portion. You seem to apply from... Uh, if you expose these uh, mature aspen to too much sun too quickly, mm -hmm. you know you can uh, have some mortality. So that might have implications for how much conifer you remove, right? Yeah, and and again, the, the more research is needed to really understand what you know when those risk factors become important for for death. What we found was that they removed a lot of conifers in that one site. And you see, even the younger stems were 120 years old. You know, the older stems had a mean age of over 140, which is old for, for Aspen stems. Um, and so I think, you know, like most questions in the sciences, the answer is it really depends. It depends on the vigor and the age of the residual Aspen. And, um, and that's, you know, about as good an answer as I can give you. You know, that Wayne Shepherd example in Colorado where they had those two stems um, and they removed all the conifers around those. That was a successful treatment. Um, why it was different in that stand in California, 
it's hard to know. Um, probably soil moisture is, is also important, uh, as well as you know the degree of conifer thinning and the, the age of the of the stems that are left there. So I think we still need to to better understand that. This sun scald is not a common um, observation, and so potentially this was an outlier that we that we saw here. Um, but especially at the fringes of a of a plant's distribution or in a site that maybe is becoming more dry than, than when the aspen originally established there. I think those are, those are red flags for um, maybe having a little more caution. Okay, um, we probably should uh, wrap this up. Uh, Dave Passaway was asking about if gradual removal of counterfers would prevent sun scalds. What you're saying is essentially is that the sun scalds might not be, you know, a common phenomenon. Um, also, uh, I guess that the silviculture of propagating aspen stands uh, in different conifer settings probably not very well documented, is it? No, and I think you know Dave's question is good. I think the trade-off there is multiple entries. Uh, I think you know potentially leaving some strategically on the southern side of, of the most vulnerable trees is probably a good idea um, if if the the treatment could be done carefully such that that you know the Future entries are not are not going to you know kill a lot of the regeneration that's already happened. I think that could be successful. I think it would take a skilled um, uh, a skilled technician or, or um, um, personnel to, to do that. But I think I think that's something that's been suggested.